1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And then I thought, nah. And I got them straight back out again. <laughs> now, one of those childish things was uh, Doctor Who, the television programme. And I do sometimes ask myself whether it's good and right and proper for a, a bloke in his late 40s to still be enjoying a show that he first became aware of when he was frightened by a sea devil just about a few months before his third birthday. There's a sea devil. There's me. So frightened I'm trying to jam a felt-tip pen into my mouth and missing. So when I think that it's probably not a good thing for a man in his late 40s to be obsessing about still, I remember something that the doctor himself once said, which is this. There's no point being grown up if you can't be childish sometimes. Most people who know Doctor Who think of it as science fiction. That's how it's described on Wikipedia, so it must be true. I quite like the idea that former showrunner Stephen Moffat had that it was some kind of sort of modern fairy tale. Now, for those who don't know, it was cobbled together by committee back in the late 1962 leading into 1963, uh, working on some ideas that the new head of drama, Sidney Newman, had come up with. The first episode... An Unearthly Child, was broadcast on BBC One at 5.15pm on Saturday the 23rd of November 1963. Just to give a bit of historical context, that's before I was born, it's also the day after John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. The story at this time involved the investigation by two school teachers into the home life of one of their students, uh, the unearthly child of the title, Susan Foreman. Barbara Wright and Ian Chesterton, the teachers, go to Susan's address, which is 76 Totters Lane, Shoreditch, London. doesn't exist. I've looked. And what they discover is just a junkyard. And in the junkyard, a police telephone box. And in the police telephone box, Susan and her eccentric and less than welcoming grandfather, who's known only as the Doctor. What they also discover is that the laws of physics have been turned inside out and upside down because the box is bigger on the inside than the outside, and they are swept away on an adventure in space and time in a ship which they know now is called the TARDIS, Time and Relative Dimension in Space, although it later, for some reason, became Dimensions in Space, probably because it sounds better. Now, the founding ethos of this program was that it should be educational, that each story should contain, and this is from the memo that went around the BBC, should contain a core of information based on strong, solid fact. Five weeks in, a sucker arm slid into view and pinned Barbara against the wall of an alien city on a dead planet. And ignoring all the injunctions by Sidney Newman, stern rules he'd put down against what he called bug-eyed monsters and tin robots, and they are in fact neither of these things, the Daleks had arrived. Now, this meant that no child could ever again look at a sink plunger or an egg whisk in quite the same way. But it also meant this new series, which initially commissioned for only 12 weeks, could have been pulled at that point. This new series, firstly, had lots of merchandise that it could sell. Secondly, that it could explore themes beyond the French Revolution and the history of the Aztecs. It could look at issues of our relationship to technology, recent memories of genocide and the atom bomb, our anxieties about the pollution and the environment. Over the next 26 years, it was revealed gradually, piece by piece, that the doctor could change his body in order to cheat death and to prolong the series and the merchandise, that he was a time lord from the planet Gallifrey, that he had two hearts and no dress sense. <laughs> the final episode of the original run of Doctor Who 
was aired in April of 1989. By this time, seven actors, all white, all male, had played the Doctor on television. And for the next 16 years, apart from one TV movie which showed, aired in 1996, and a rich proliferation of fan-produced novels, videos, and audio dramas, it seemed as if the series was finished. Then in March 2005, it came back. Christopher Eccleston was playing the Doctor, Billy Piper was playing a character called Rose Tyler, and it very quickly became a global flagship program for the corporation. Three more white male actors have played the part of the Doctor since then, and played it superbly. But when the series returns in October of this year, the Doctor will be played by a woman, the brilliant Jodie Whittaker. And it's about time. So much for the potted history. Back to that idea of childishness. See, I don't think Doctor Who is childish. Any more than any other fairy tale or myth is childish. It could be Little Red Riding Hood, which, let's face it, in its earliest known versions, contains a werewolf, cannibalism, and bestiality. You could think of the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest stories that has survived. You could think of A Midsummer Night's Dream. The key thing here is not whether a story is real. It's not whether it's fact or fiction, fantastical or realistic. It's whether it means something to us and what. This is as true of the book of Genesis as it is of Coronation Street. It's as true of Stranger Things as it is of the economic predictions of Her Majesty's Treasury or the stories woven by theoretical physicists to explain the origins of the universe. Whether the voyage of Odysseus or the implementation of Brexit turn out to be true bothers me far less than what they say about us and how they might make us act. The plausibility of Donald Trump's desire to make America great again doesn't keep me awake at night half as much as the thought of how he might go about achieving this. So this talk is about myth, the power of myth in the modern world. And I'm using myth really loosely as just about the stories we tell. So I don't mean myth as something true or not true. It might be true, might not be true. I don't really care. It's about myth as the stories we tell to make sense of the world and our place within it. Which takes me back to the sea devil. There he is, she is. Not good on sexing sea devils. It rose from the waters of Whitecliff Bay on the Isle of Wight with several others. And they were all wearing these oversized string vests, which I later worked out, or discovered, that were due to the director being a little bit nervous about the possible corrupting effect of showing prehistoric reptile people in the nude. The point about the sea devils is, they kind of frightened me. The fear was quite important. And if you think about this, the broadcasting of this story, it was in six parts, went on forever in many ways, um, went on for six, in six parts, and it spanned the end of February to the start of April 1972. The sight of the Sea Devils was not just one of my earliest Doctor Who memories, it's also one of my earliest memories full stop. So the fear of these creatures, the shock of fear that I got, but the pleasure of that shock of fear, is really tied up with my earliest sense of storytelling and the power of storytelling. I was scared of the sea devils because of their monstrous otherness, their difference. I was scared of them because they were dangerous, they killed people. And maybe initially that was enough for me. Maybe that's all that can be expected from a toddler who was probably far too young to be watching the program in the first place. But a few years later, when I read the novelization of the story, and when I in fact coloured it in, bless me, and here it is, this doesn't stop, by the way. My mum sent me a model of Peter Capaldi just this morning. My brother gave me a Cyberman figure a few weeks ago. My kids are infected as well. It's not going to stop. It's passed down the gene pool now. The thing was, when I read the novelization, which went into much more detail, and of course I was a bit older, what I realized was I wasn't so much scared of the difference of the sea devils, their monstrousness, but their similarity to us. They were noble, ingenious, intelligent, capricious, and really vulnerable. 
Unlike a lot of aliens and monsters in science fiction, sea devils weren't bulletproof. And it seemed to me, when I read the book, hang on, they probably have a stronger claim to this planet as we do. They are dinosaurs who've slept under the earth for millions of years. They're coming back to claim it from the hairy upstart apes who've taken it over in the meantime. They were here first. Now, this is a really important thing. When I think back to how I got into Doctor Who in the first place and what it means to me now, what I think of is not that it frightened me so much, but that the fear made me ask questions, made me ask questions about myself and my place in the world. I started to ask questions like, who am I? What am I? What is this place? What are we doing here? What's that over there? What's it all about? This is what mythologies do. They force us to ask questions. And it turned out the doctor himself had been driven by just these kind of questions to leave his own race, the Time Lords, and to steal a TARDIS and run away into the universe. He'd was driven by two really good instincts, curiosity and non-conformity. And he was driven to reject his own people's boringness, if that's even a word, their settlement into particular habits and traditions, their sort of high-tech inertia, the fact that he didn't seem interested in the rest of the universe. So he got in the TARDIS and he ran off to find out his own answers. Now, the Doctor has no methodology. He's completely chaotic. He takes risks, he gets things wrong, he contradicts himself repeatedly. But he is exemplary in his spirit of inquiry and in his ability to improvise in any given situation. This is inspiring. Now, some people have complained that Doctor Who is essentially a conservative mythology that the Doctor champions and endorses established power structures, that he seems to support a really simplistic view of good and evil, the binaries that we all live within. And it's true, you can take the politics of Doctor Who and you can reduce them to a caricature, you can parody them through selective analysis. So, for instance, the 1979 story, Creature from the Pit, can be seen as a story in which the Doctor champions free market economics whilst talking into a bloated, glowing uh, alien phallus. As you can see here, this is his way of communicating with this creature. He talked into its penis, essentially. Didn't think about that when I saw it when I was 10. I've thought about it since. But I think there's more to the story than that, a lot more, and there's different ways of reading it. A lot of myth now, a lot of the greatest myths of the modern day, seem to be about people finding a sense of belonging finding the box that fits them, finding a sense of identity. Are you Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Slytherin? Are you Jedi or Sith? Now, the Time Lords of Gallifrey have their own categories. The Arcalian, Terulian, Dromian, Patrex, Prydonian, and Skenderly's chapters of the Time Lord Academy. But the Doctor rejects these because of this instinct, this dissenting instinct that he has, he throws these away. He says, I don't want to be part of this. So he runs away. He's not clubbable. He doesn't want to join anything. This is actually him. He is Prydonian by birth, and that's him in his Prydonian robes. The only time he's ever worn them on screen. Very fetching. All the time lords are color coordinated, by the way. He rejects this idea of being a Prydonian, but he does. He uses it when he needs to. So he has at various points, strategically, maneuvered his way into being the Time Lord High President and, in fact, the President of Earth. But he only does this pragmatically. It never suits him, these roles. He's got no interest in taking on a, a power structure, so he's not interested in becoming a particular function or adapting to a pecking order. The French philosopher Paul Ricoeur wrote really well about myth. And at one point, he writes about myth as being a, a positive, liberating, even utopian force within culture. To him, myth forms or draws upon what he calls our social imagination. It can lead us to become the bearers of other possible worlds. And in fact, it can tell stories which show us beyond the, the horizon of the possible, as he refers to it. And to me, this is what Doctor Who does. It's what the Doctor represents. 
this ability to push, to challenge, to ask questions. It's that curiosity thing that the doctor has. So one of the things that strikes me is the doctor is, whatever else he might be, strangely human. Sounds odd, that. This most alien of heroes seems the most humane, driven by a kind of ethical complexity. He's not a muscular hero like Hercules or Superman, but he is cerebral, temperamental, witty, fundamentally questioning of his own morals, his own ethics, and challenging of ours. I'm going to close by referring to two scenes which I think sum up what I think is the perplexed, rebellious, passionately alien humanity of this character. This is a scene from a 1975 story, Genesis of the Daleks. The Doctor, played by Tom Baker, this is the fourth Doctor of the original series, he's been sent back to Scarrow, where the Daleks come from, and he's been told, this is his mission, to destroy them at the point of their creation, so that they will never become the scourge of the universe. And here he is, he's outside the incubator room, he's got two ends of wire, and all he has to do is touch two ends of wire together, he'll blow up the incubator room, destroy the Daleks forever. That's his mission. And he stops, he freezes in a moment of self-doubt, and he says to his companions, if someone who knew the future pointed out a child to you and told you that that child would grow up to be totally evil, to be a ruthless dictator who would destroy millions of lives, could you then kill that child. It's the Hitler conundrum. Forty years later, Peter Capaldi, in a story called The Zygon Inversion, delivers the following monologue in a challenge to humans and Zygons who stand at the brink of mutual destruction. And he says this. This is a scale model of war. Every war ever fought, right here in front of you, because it's always the same. When you fire that first shot, no matter how right you feel, you have no idea who's going to die. You don't know whose children will scream and burn, how much blood will be spilled, how many lives will be shattered, how many hearts broken, until everybody does what they were always going to have to do from the very beginning. Sit down and talk. Listen to me. Listen. I just want you to think. You know what thinking is? It's just a fancy word for changing your mind. That kind of speech gets my oxytocin going. Let's refer to Simon's uh, talk at the start. So, what am I saying here? Am I asking you to all go and watch Doctor Who? Well, yes. Please do. It's very good, and it's never done me any harm. You must watch Doctor Who or you will be exterminated! <laughs> See, never done me any harm at all. But more than that, I'm saying, the effect of this myth on this one life across the last 45 years is the power that any myth can have on any one of you. Could be the myth of climbing rock faces. Could be the myth of succeeding in the job that you've set yourself. Everybody has their personal myths, their personal mythographies, and they feed through our lives. So what I'm saying, this conference has as its theme the purple parachute. I did think for a while about trying to fashion this somehow out of the heliotrope robes of the Patrex Academy chapter. They're purple. But I think instead, rather than offering you a purple parachute, I'm offering you a blue box. Go on. Run away. Find your myth. Thank you. <laughs>